Okay, so first up, we'll go with uh, DECQ to start. Um, so this method, it uh, was designed for high throughput data and it takes in uh, these unnormalized gene counts and then it applies its own median of ratios normalization. Um, so I think this uh, specific normalization approach was uh, covered in the normalization lecture, but just to review the median of ratios is this scaling factor um, that is calculated for each sample uh, to account for uh, the sequencing depth, the differences in sequencing depth between samples. Um, and it's computed as the median of the gene expression ratios between uh, each sample and then the pseudo reference sample, which is just the uh, geometric average across all the samples. Uh, so hopefully this, uh, these steps are sounding somewhat familiar. Uh, but after we have those normalized counts, the next step then is to test whether genes are differentially expressed. So in DEC2, the assumption that's made for the gene counts is that they follow the negative binomial distribution. Uh, so in this notation here, the distribution of gene uh, I in sample J is parameterized by uh, this negative binomial where the uh, centered around the mean uh, mu ij, and then um, the variance is given uh, by this dispersion of uh, alpha i. Um, and then, so these, they use these gene-wise uh, generalized linear models with the log link. Uh, so the expected log normalized counts of a gene are made to be linearly dependent um, on these experimental variables R that you want to test or control for. Um, so I think that hopefully this uh, GLM form uh, looks familiar from last week. Uh, so then from these formulas, uh, the algorithm takes the observed data and estimates the log fold change for each gene, uh, which is represented by the beta coefficients um, in these linear models here. And uh, to test for statistical significance, typically the null hypothesis that we'll test is whether the log fold change is equal to zero. Uh, so DEC2 uses the walled test to do this. Um, so they compute a Z statistic uh, for the log fold change, which uh, is just calculated as the LFC over the standard error. Um, and then the Z statistic asymptotically should follow a standard normal distribution. So that's how the p-values get computed. Um, and then as we discussed last week, the correction for multiple comparisons is crucial here. So DEC2 will use the uh, benjamini hockberg method for controlling the false discovery rate. Um, and so I think I alluded to this earlier, a lot of times with RNA-seq studies, and especially when the sample size is small, um, these statistical methods uh, can be challenging to implement because we have very small uh, amount of information about each gene and its variants. Um, so that makes it hard to get uh, reliable estimates. Um, so what a lot of these statistical algorithms will do to kind of mitigate that is they'll implement um, uh, some strategies that can pull more stable estimates from a limited amount of information. Um, and usually that's done uh, using like an empirical phase approach to share information across genes and kind of learn more about the data set than uh, you might have um, like from ground zero and then improve uh, those log fold change and variance estimates. Uh, so we'll kind of illustrate what that looks like next. Uh, so yeah, so both DEC and Lima actually do this, uh, uh, this shrinking of the dispersion estimates. Um, and both of them actually take an empirical Bayes approach to this. Um, so essentially uh, this empirical Bayes approach just means that they're going to use the observed data to first empirically estimate what we call uh, prior distributions or the means and variances. Um, and then those priors are used to update the calculations for the log fold change. Um, so this, yeah, this sort of approach basically lets us leverage the patterns that we already see in the data um, to try and uh, get ourselves to more accurate estimates. Uh, so for this variance or dispersion estimate, 
um, both DEC2 and Lima do this by estimating a mean variance trend that captures the relationship between um, a given gene's like mean expression and then uh, its variance. So in the plot on the right here, this is from the uh, DEC2 paper. Um, these are two different data sets that are shown, um, but the information conveyed is, is the same. So uh, on the on the X axis here, we have the mean of the normalized counts. On the Y axis is that dispersion estimate. Um, and then each of these black dots are uh, the initial dispersion estimates for a particular gene. So um, these are all estimated with the uh, maximum likelihood estimation. And then this red curve through the middle here, that is the mean dispersion trend that gets fitted uh, through those black points. And um, this sort of approximates what we believe should be the ground truth for the dispersion uh, of, of a gene uh, with a particular average expression. Um, so then the prior distributions for the log of the dispersion parameter are modeled this way. Um, so these are normally distributed and centered around this predicted uh, value. So given by the, the red line uh, based on the trend. Um, so this is how we kind of get more information about the distribution of each uh, of these log fold changes. And then um, at inference time, so when it comes to actually computing the log fold change estimate, um, the effect of this prior distribution is essentially to shrink those dispersion estimates uh, toward this trended red value. Um, and the effect of this shrinkage is stronger, especially when the sample size is small or if the estimate deviates a lot from the trend. Um, so it's kind of a, a graded application of this uh, prior shrinkage. And then, um, so these some of these points, there are these genes that are circled here in blue, um, these are picked up as outlying estimates. Um, so for the, uh, these cases, uh, the assumption is that, that they're far enough from the trended fit that uh, it would be somewhat unreasonable to assume that uh, the same prior can be used for these genes. Um, so for uh, these outlying genes, the shrinkage is not applied. Okay, so the second type of shrinkage that uh, only DEseq does is a shrinkage of the log full change estimates themselves. Um, so what this does is to help address the fact that genes with low read counts tend to be uh, more noisy and have higher variance. Um, so in a similar way, we want to push uh, those genes towards the more likely values, which are assumed to be around zero. Um, so to do this, the algorithm first computes an initial set of log full changes by maximum likelihood estimation. Um, and those are used to uh, obtain this zero centered normal distribution as the prior uh, for each coefficient. So the prior is constructed uh, in this form here. Uh, so where the mean is already fixed at zero and then the variance uh, for that experimental variable is estimated by the distribution of uh, those MLEs. Um, and in a similar way to the, uh, to the shrinkage for the dispersion, the effect of this prior uh, is to push the log fold changes of genes with low expression or high variance towards those more likely estimates near zero. And um, the exact strength of that shrinkage is controlled by something called uh, the observed Fisher's information, which essentially just captures the amount of information in the data that can be used for estimating the log full change. Um, so kind of all of these uh, all together, all these shrinkage methods um, and the initial distribution assumptions of DEseq uh, come together to provide um, a stronger estimate of the log full change and its variance for each gene.